friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise, or one of her more sophisticated clones, and today we are talking about snake venom, types of venom, how it's delivered, and just how much trouble you might be in if you get a toothy kiss from a venomous snake. Lots to cover, so let's go! Okay, housekeeping item to get out of the way. We have to do the obligatory venom versus poison talk. I know, I know, okay, you've heard it before and I'll be honest, I don't wanna do it again, but the elders of the internet demand that anytime a reptile YouTuber talks about venomous snakes or snake venom, they have to explain the difference between poison and venom. Look, I don't make the rules, but I did not do that on my European Adders video and I was punished with laggy internet for about a week. So just don't make the elders of the internet mad, okay? Here goes. Poison is something that will make you sick or dead by being ingested or absorbed. Eating a poisonous mushroom or absorbing toxin from a poison dart frog through your skin, that kind of thing. Venom, on the other hand, tends to be injected into you via a bite or a sting. A rattlesnake's fangs piercing into your skin and muscle to pump toxins into the bloodstream. Or a wasp that's angry for no reason at all, just flying up and stinging you in your face while you're minding your own business eating an orange popsicle swimming at your cousin's pool. Oddly specific. Uh-huh. Now, there are actually poisonous snakes out there that might not be safe to eat. Garter snakes, hognose snakes, keelback snakes, but generally speaking, when someone says poisonous snake, they mean venomous. And it's every reptile enthusiast's solemn duty to aggressively correct them when they get that wrong, okay? That's out of the way. The evolution of snake venom is very complex, but the high level explanation is that snake venom is an evolved form of saliva and is produced in modified salivary glands. Saliva does more than just lubricate your food to go down easier. It is an important part of the digestion process. Enzymes in our saliva start digesting starches in our food as soon as we start chewing. Scientists have identified the gene responsible for producing those enzymes in us, and it is the same gene responsible for producing the roided up enzymes and proteins in snake venom. Hundreds of millions of years ago, one of our super distant common ancestors started down the path of having more potent spit as a way to speed up digestion. Killing what was bitten was more of a side effect of that pre-digestion. That made it easier for the ancestral snakes to catch and eat their prey. The faster it worked, the safer it was for the snake, the more they got to eat. So for those snakes with the slightly spicier spit goobers, the evolutionary process favored more and more potent saliva and better and better ways to deliver it. Many scientists think that the evolution of venom and the change from mechanical ways to subdue prey, like what Monty here uses by constricting their prey, to biochemical ways was what allowed snakes to expand across the entire globe. Some types of venom are specifically tailored to a certain species of prey. Some are more inclusive in their ability to ruin one's day. And there's a broad range of how much trouble you will be in in a venomous snake bite situation. There are two main factors at play when venom is injected. The actual toxicity of the venom, how concentrated or potent it is, and the yield, how much is available to inject. Yield is pretty straightforward to figure out. You measure how much venom you can squeeze out a snake, replicate that over a big enough sample size, and you can figure out the average yield. Easy peasy, snake venom squeezy? Potency is a little bit trickier. A bite that's fatal to an mouse might not do much to you or me. There's a huge difference in mass between a mouse and a human, usually. You need to measure the toxicity against a common denominator and the typical standard benchmark does that in milligrams to kilograms of body mass or micrograms or even nanograms for super duper deadly toxins. That standard benchmark is the median lethal dose or LD50. LD standing for lethal dose of a toxin, pathogen, or radiation, and 50 corresponds to 50% of the test population, the median. Basically, it is a dosage in milligrams per kilogram required to kill 50% of a test group within a specified test duration. There are limitations that affect the accuracy, which is why you might find slightly different figures in different studies. Things like genetic characteristics of the sample population, environmental factors, and mode of administration can all skew results. But broadly speaking, it is a reliable indicator of toxicity. 
In a nutshell, the lower the LD50 of a toxin, the more potent the toxin. So basically, the less you need of it to be fatal. Let's look at the iconic King Cobra. The first thing that comes to mind for a lot of folks when they think of a venomous snake. They have an LD50 of 1.09 milligrams per kilogram. But compared to the most venomous rattlesnake, the tiger rattlesnake, king cobra venom is very weak. Tiger rattlesnake venom has an LD50 of 0.056 milligrams per kilogram, 20 times smaller than a king cobra's, meaning 20 times more powerful. But the king cobra is still considered the far more deadly snake. Why is that? Good question. I'll tell you. The king cobra's average yield, how much venom they deliver in one bite, is more than 150 times greater than that of the tiger rattlesnakes. So even though drop for drop it has far weaker venom, king cobras produce such a mind-boggling amount of it that it more than makes up for the lower potency and is a far scarier snake to get tagged by. I love them. <laughs> snake venom is pretty scary stuff, right? But there's good news too. News so good, I bet that you'll be moved to hit that little like button. You know the one, it's just right down there, there. It's down there somewhere, it looks like that. You'll be moved to click it. All right, you ready to hear it? Here goes. As deadly as snake venom can be, it also saves countless lives. Many of you may be aware that snake venom is used to make snake anti-venom or anti-venin. This is a critical medication used to treat victims of snake bites. Did you know that there are between 80,000 to 100,000 deaths worldwide from snake bites every year? The vast majority of these are in developing countries without access to reliable healthcare and by extension, anti-venom. A few years ago, the World Health Organization released a $136 million plan to cut that number in half by 2030. The plan focuses on educating communities on how to prevent snake bites and provide more widespread anti-venom medication to impoverished countries that have been unable to receive proper care. Antivenom is not the only type of medication produced by snake venom. Scientists have already created life-saving drugs that lower blood pressure, others that can dissolve blood clots, preventing heart attacks and strokes, medication used in pre-surgery to reduce complications, pain relief medications, drugs that treat diabetes, autoimmune disease, even cancer. Countless lives have been saved by the venom of these incredible animals, and with ongoing research into the properties of snake venom, countless more in the future. How cool is that? I'll tell you how cool. It is as cool as these people here on either side of me. These are my patrons on Patreon. They are a huge help to my channel and I am eternally grateful for their support. My patrons get access to videos early, they know about new animals and new projects that I'm working on that YouTube does not get to be privy to. They get behind the scenes stuff and more. If you'd like to support my channel and me and my snakes, head on over to patreon.com slash allcanadianreptilegirl and see what's available. So thank you. So we can determine how deadly a venom is, but this does not tell us how it works. Snake venom is very complex. Toxic proteins are the cause of most of the harmful effects. There are also enzymes which speed up reactions that break chemical bonds which destroy the prey's tissue. Depending on the type of venom, these enzymes can lower blood pressure, destroy red blood cells, and inhibit muscle control. The different varieties of venom are a lot, and it is very nuanced, but they fall into three main types of snake venom, cytotoxins, neurotoxins, and hematoxins. Many snakes even mix and match different types of venom, you know, just to keep things interesting. Cytotoxins are basically digestive juices that dissolve tissue, muscle, and even bone from the site of the bite, and can eventually cause hemorrhage and death. Some tissue may even experience something called liquefactive necrosis, don't, don't Google that, which means the dead tissue gets partially or completely liquefied. King cobra venom is largely cytotoxic, as is gaboon vipers and puff adders. Neurotoxic venom attacks the nerve. It blocks the electrical signals from nerve cells reaching muscles, effectively paralyzing them. 
The venom itself doesn't kill you, it just stops your muscles from working, and if those muscles happen to be the ones that you need to, you know, breathe or pump blood, maybe run to get help, you're in for a not so wonderful time. Many elapids like coral snakes and sea snakes often use this type of venom. I know I said a minute ago that king cobra venom is largely cytotoxic, well, it's a lot of neurotoxins too. Remember the mix and match to keep things interesting? There you go. Hematoxins attack the blood, either by rupturing red blood cells and causing massive internal bleeding and death, or ramping up blood clotting, which can cause blockages leading to strokes and, yep, you guessed it, death. Who's that knocking at the door? <laughs> yes, it's death. Let him most rattlesnakes rely on this type of venom. They also use the distinctive smell of blood being broken down to track their bitten prey so that they can safely eat it after it has succumbed to the venom. It's actually a pretty good strategy. A quick bite, release, and then sit back and let the venom do the work knowing that you can sniff out your oozing meal later. Not bad, eh? Scientists think that snake venom evolved independently in multiple families of snakes. This could be why snakes have evolved different ways of delivering their deadly goobers. Vipers, for example, have evolved hinged, hollow fangs that flip forward when they strike, kind of like giant hypodermic needles on a swivel. This type of fang is called selenoglyphid. They are the most sophisticated type of fang and can quickly deliver a huge amount of venom into the deep tissue of their prey, really quickly. Being able to tuck them away with a hinge means that they can grow huge and still be able to close their mouth. The Kaboom Viper from Central Africa, for example, has the world's largest fangs that grow to two inches long. If you're thinking that two inches does not sound like much, that's about how long a leopard's canine tooth is, and I don't know of many folks making fun of them for their eat bitty little chompers, and they don't even have venom, they just poke holes in you, eh? Elapids like cobras and coral snakes have fixed fangs called proteroglyphus. Because they are immovable and cannot be tucked away, they only get about a third as long as a viper's. They compensate by either hanging on and really chewing the venom in, or by having enormous powerful muscular glands that can squirt in a buttload at a time and at a very high pressure. Some, like the spitting cobra, have figured out that the high pressure stream doesn't necessarily need to be injected. They can just squirt it at you from over two meters away like the worst super soaker imaginable. And scientists have learned that they are exceptionally good at aiming for the eyes. Fun. My very own venomous snakes use a more subtle understated fang. Yep, my venomous snakes. I actually have 19 venomous snakes from five species in my care. <gasps> Gasp. Are my parents crazy? Letting a kid my age keep and handle venomous snakes, not to mention free handle them. What? Here are some now. This is Cobra, one of my Lake Chapala garter snakes, and this is Higgins, one of my two Plains hognose snakes. They and the other garter snakes and hognose snake that I have are venomous. Their venom is extremely mild. In the garter snake's case, it may be powerful enough to sedate a toad or a frog and has no real effect on humans at all. The hognose snake's venom is a little bit more potent and broadly effective, but still generally not dangerous to humans unless you have an allergic reaction or do something foolish like let them chomp on you for a really long time. Garter snakes and hognose snakes are part of the largest family of snakes, colubrids. There aren't many confirmed venomous colubrid species, but those that are are rear fanged or opisthoglyphus. With no large muscular conspicuous venom glands, they deliver their their venom using fangs at the back of their mouth. Those rear fangs closest to the venom ducts are really just a means to facilitate venom getting into their prey. Some rear fangs even have grooves in the fangs to sort of help guide the venom into the wound, but they all kind of just chew their venom in. It's not very streamlined, they just kind of just, well, I'm chewing. Instead of directly injecting their venom, it kind of oozes into the bite. Copper here would basically have to be trying to eat me to deliver any venom, which, as I said earlier, is absolutely harmless to humans. They pose no threat. It's very weak venom. That's not to say that there aren't more dangerous rear-fanged venomous colubrids out there. We've met the hognose snake, which make adorable and popular pet snakes. Their venom is about as potent as a bee sting. 
maybe. Not really dangerous usually, but not something that's a whole lot of fun, you know? The flying snake from Southeast Asia has a far more powerful venom, ditto for South America's false water cobra. And of course there's the deadly boom slang, an arboreal snake from Africa that has what I think is the coolest name for a snake. Come on, boom slang. It's fun to say, it like reverberates in your chest. Anyways, like I said, there aren't many confirmed venomous colubrids, but because their venom delivery system is a lot more understated than vipers or lapids, it is thought that there might actually be more out there that we just don't know of. We just aren't looking close enough. Neat, eh? Rarest type of fang is called Atractespis. Oh, hi. Actually, it's a good thing that you're here. I just realized whilst editing that I made a mistake while filming. There was a part in the script that must have just gotten taken out by accident and didn't make it onto the teleprompter and then I didn't realize it while filming and neither did dad. Not passing any blame or anything at all. Anyways, it didn't make it into the video, so let me explain. Um, I said that the type of fang was called a tractaspis. It is not. That is the name of the genus of snakes that has the extremely modified selenoglyphus fang. So just to kind of clear that up there, sorry for the confusion. All right, back to the other one. These are used by many species of burrowing snakes. There's not a lot of room for conventional striking and underground burrows where they hunt. So in order to subdue their subterranean prey, they employ a very interesting strategy that uses their exceptionally long knife-like fangs. They're so long that they actually are poking out the sides of their closed mouths. So they slide up next to their prey and either slash downwards or sideways to stab their fangs into their meal. The stiletto snake actually takes this a step further and uses a spring-loaded fang in an extremely flexible socket-like joint that allows them to bite at a huge range of angles without even opening their mouth. If you decide to, for whatever reason, freehandle an angry stiletto snake, there is virtually no way that you can hold it where it cannot bite you. So, uh, good luck with that. Venom is why a lot of people are afraid of snakes in general, and I get it. It is scary stuff. My hope, though, is that by learning more about it, and by learning about more about these amazing animals in general, then we can understand them better and fear them less, but respect them more. I think that that'll do it for today. I hope that you enjoyed learning a tiny bit about snake venom. I've learned a whole bunch doing research for this fascinating topic. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, please hit the like, even though I already asked for that, so I hopefully you did it then. Subscribe, all that YouTube stuff. But most importantly, remember to nurture all nature, even the ones with the spicy goobers. Bye. Let go of my sleeve. You're holding on to the... Mm. Moving on. One second. Nope. Go with it. Use it. For example, let's look at the iconic King Cobra. You're in my hair. You offered it as a blanket to him. <laughs> yeah, but hi, sir. <laughs> okay, this will do. Step next to their prey and slash down or sideways into their- that was not the right motions. Yeah, <laughs>